Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Status, where medicine makes perfect sense. Continuing our nephrology playlist, we're talking about kidney diseases. We have finished discussing the nephrotic syndromes and the nephritic syndromes. We started talking about acute kidney failure in the previous videos. Today, we'll learn how to diagnose and manage acute kidney failure or acute renal azotemia or acute renal insufficiency or acute kidney injury. When my kidney is toast, my kidney is unable to get rid of the waste products in the urine. So all of that waste is gonna pile up in my blood, giving me this pale color. Uremia will lead to skin frosting and itching, big time. Also fatigue, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and cognitive decline. If I develop kidney failure, I'll be unable to concentrate on task and pay attention. Let's get started. Please watch the videos in this nephrology playlist in order. A good kidney should get rid of urea and creatinine in the urine, but if I have kidney failure, I cannot do that, so all of the urea will end up in my blood, uremia. A good kidney should get rid of BUN and creatinine in the urine. The ratio should be greater than 15 for reasons that we discussed before. A good kidney should not excrete too much sodium because sodium is precious to the body, so the fractional excretion of sodium should be less than 1%. A good kidney should be capable of concentrating the urine, which means high urine osmolality, relatively speaking, and the normal urine volume is 1 to 2 liters per day. Why do you call it acute kidney injury? Because the deterioration is rapid. Injury, it is reversible. Unlike end stage kidney disease, which is irreversible. When my kidney cannot get rid of waste products in the urine, what's gonna happen? They will end up accumulating in my blood. Nitrogenous wastes in the blood, azotemia. So I have acute kidney failure, which means lots of urea in the blood, uremia, uremic acidosis, azotemia, renal failure, GFR and urine volume are decreased, serum BUN and creatinine are high. Don't forget that acute or chronic renal failure will give me high anion gap metabolic acidosis, but renal tubular acidosis will give me normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Acute kidney injury has three types, pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal, and three stages. We talked about all of this in great detail in previous videos in this nephrology playlist. Pre-renal, the problem is before the kidney, such as decreased kidney perfusion. How about post-renal? The problem is after the kidney, in the outflow. How about intra-renal? The problem started inside the kidney. In pre-renal azotemia, do not blame the kidney, the problem is before the kidney. So, so far it's a good kidney. The ratio is greater than 15, which is good. FENA is less than 1%, which is good. Urine osmolality is greater than 500, which is also good. But if the problem is in the kidney, the kidney is toast. You get the exact opposite. Low ratio, bad. FENA more than 2%, bad and the kidney is unable to concentrate the urine, also bad. How about post-renal? Well, early on, it's not the kidney's fault, so, so far we have a good kidney, just like here. However, later, it becomes a bad kidney, just like here. What are the signs and symptoms of acute kidney failure? Fatigue, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and itching. Mental status changes and cognitive problems are common. Symptoms of volume depletion include, I feel dirt in my eyes, I feel thirsty, dizzy, I faint, especially when I stand up suddenly. Signs include dry skin, sunken fontanelles in neonates, poor skin, turgor, hypotension, tachycardia, orthostasis. In kidney failure, GFR goes down, BON and creatinine in the blood go up, and I have less urine volume. Oligor in pre-renal, it's a good kidney, usually due to hypoperfusion. So how do I treat it? Give the patient fluid, like normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride solution. When everything hits the fan, dialysis. How about intrarenal azotemia? Signs and symptoms are very similar, although they will be more severe than pre-renal azotemia for sure especially the uremia skin frosting or the chalky white deposits, uremic facies, which are pale and sometimes called toxic. It's a very characteristic look of the kidney disease patient. It's very difficult to describe in words. That's why just doctors call it toxic look. But once you see it many times, you will be able to recognize a patient with kidney failure 
from a distance. Just like how a nurse with experience can recognize your cephalic vein from two miles apart. My kidney is being hammered by a toxin, a contrast dye, heavy metal, or a drug. What should I do? Stop the offending agent, treat the underlying cause, hit me with dialysis. Remember the three stages? Initiation, maintenance, recovery. In the maintenance phase, we get hyperkalemia, but in the recovery phase, we can get some hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, etc. So be very careful because that will determine how you can treat your patient. GFR is very important to diagnose acute or chronic renal failure. So look at this. In pre-renal, GFR is starting to decrease. Initiation, even worse. Extension, maintenance, that's the lowest GFR that you will get. After this, recovery. Woohoo! Urine volume will increase. The patient will literally flood the hospital and the doctor will be so happy about it because the kidney function is getting better. Instead of oliguria, we get polyuria. Post-renal azotemia is usually due to an obstruction, so try to treat the underlying obstruction. How can we diagnose acute kidney failure? Let's take acute tubular necrosis or intra-renal azotemia as an example. We need some urine tests, don't forget the GFR of course, and we need some blood tests. Can you tell me what should we expect that the urine volume be in this case? How about urine osmolality, high or low? Specific gravity, urine cast. Please pause and try to answer all of these yourselves. Are you ready? Urine volume should go down because it's called oliguria. Urine osmolality should go down. The kidney is unable to concentrate the urine. It's also unable to produce urine. Urine specific gravity is low. The kidney is unable to concentrate the urine. Urine casts are muddy brown granular or pigmented casts. FENA is high, not good. Urine sodium is high, not good. BUN in the blood, high. Creatinine, high. BUN to creatinine ratio, low, which means the kidney is unable to reabsorb BUN. So the numerator goes down and therefore the entire ratio goes down below 15. Let's do arterial blood gases. pH, low, because all of that waste that's accumulating in my blood includes sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, lactic acid, uric acid, all kinds of acids. And these acids will lead to acidosis. Is it the kidney's fault or the lung's fault? Kidney's fault. So would you call it respiratory or metabolic acidosis? Metabolic acidosis. Bicarbonate is low. When you have too many acids in the blood, you will consume your base. You will consume your buffer system. One of the most important equations in acid-base disturbance is here. pH is proportional to bicarbonate on top and carbon dioxide at the bottom. What happened to bicarbonate here? Bicarbonate went down. Therefore, what's going to happen to the pH? It went down. This is what you call metabolic acidosis. What should be the compensation from your normal lungs? Do unto others what you want them do unto you. I should lower the denominator, just like how the numerator went down, so that we can bring the pH back to normal. So if your lungs are healthy, they will compensate by getting rid of carbon dioxide through hyperventilation. Respiratory alkalosis is the compensation of the metabolic acidosis. The accumulation of the uric acid, sulfuric acid, etc., all of these are unmeasured anions, which will increase the anion gap above 12. We call this high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Here is acidosis, here is metabolic, and here is high anion gap. Anytime you have too many protons in the blood, i.e. acidosis, you will trade with your cell. The hydrogen ion will hide in the cell to decrease the acidosis in the blood. In exchange, well, if a positive went in, a positive has to go out of the cell, and this positive is potassium. That's why most cases of acidosis are associated with hyperkalemia, too much potassium in the blood. What's the normal urine osmolality? It could be anywhere between 50 and 1200. Let's say 600 or 700 is a good number. A good kidney should be able to concentrate the urine, giving me a high number. But kidney failure, you'll get a lower number. Urine specific gravity is very similar to urine osmolality, but less accurate for reasons that we discussed before in my videos in the labs playlist. 
I have a video on urine osmolality and another video on urine specific gravity. What kind of casts do we see in cases of acute tubular necrosis? Muddy brown granular coarse casts. Brown, so they are pigmented. We get too much creatinine in the blood. What's creatinine? Creatinine is a metabolic end product of creatine phosphate metabolism, which is present in muscle. So if I see high serum creatinine, it could be kidney disease, or it could be strenuous exercise, rhabdomyolysis, excessive protein intake, etc. How about the story of urea? Urea is the metabolic end product of proteins, amino acids, and pyrimidines. High BUN in the blood could be a sign of kidney disease, or it could be because of excessive protein intake and increased protein catabolism. The difference between serum BUN and serum creatinine was discussed before in my lab's playlist. Please pause and review. What is the fractional excretion of sodium? Basically, it's a crazy equation that we have discussed before, but the moral of the story is a good kidney should not waste too much sodium in the urine. A good kidney should reabsorb more than 99% of that sodium back to the blood. That's a good kidney because it's wasting less sodium. That's a bad kidney because it's wasting too much sodium. And in my previous video on the fractional excretion of sodium, I've told you about this dilemma and how to solve it clinically. To learn more about this, please check out my video called fractional excretion of sodium in my lab's playlist and another video titled fractional excretion of urea also in the lab's playlist. Next, how can we manage acute renal failure? Please don't forget the three Ds, diet, drugs, and dialysis. But before we talk about any of these, you stop the offending agent. If it's lead poisoning, stop the exposure. Mercury poisoning, stop the exposure. Remove the patient from the bad, toxic environment. If the blood pressure is too high, we treat it, of course. Volume depletion, give fluids. Volume overload, give diuretics. Hyperkalemia, this can stop your heart. Protect the heart with calcium gluconate, calcium chloride, etc. Give insulin with glucose. Give diuretics, anything except the potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone because these will worsen the hyperkalemia. You can give beta agonists to treat hyperkalemia and you can give the potassium binding resin known as kyxalate, which will take the K, potassium, and dumps it in the stool. Diet, well, this kidney is fragile right now. We have acute kidney injury, so be very gentle on the kidney. Do not drink too much fluid, because who do you think should excrete all of that fluid that you're drinking? Your kidney. Do not overwhelm the kidney for the time being. Also, do not overwhelm your kidney with too much protein or too much salt or too much potassium because it's the kidney's job to get rid of all of these. So be very gentle on the kidney. Same thing goes for phosphate. Limit the phosphate intake. So decrease meat intake, especially beef. Decrease dairy intake. No milk, no ice cream, no yogurt, etc. Because of the fat? No. Because they have sugar? Also no, because they have phosphate, and phosphate is dangerous for the failed kidney. And when everything hits the fan, hit me with dialysis. As you know, we have peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Can we take a moment to review the treatment of hyperkalemia? First order of business, protect the heart. Who cares about the potassium level? Just protect the heart, otherwise I will die. How do you stabilize the cardiac membrane? Calcium. Calcium stabilizes the membrane. If you want to know why or how, check out my nerve physiology series in my physiology playlist. And remember that calcium is contra-excitability. That's why in tetany, when you have low calcium, what happens to your nerve excitability? High nerve excitability. That's why you get carpal spasms, pedal spasms, laryngeal spasms, all kinds of spasms, positive uh, chavistic sign and Rousseau sign. Next, give insulin with glucose. Insulin will push the potassium and the glucose together into the cell, leaving less potassium in the blood, which decreases the hyperkalemia. Why not give insulin alone without glucose? If you give insulin alone without giving glucose, insulin will push glucose into the cell, leaving less glucose in the blood, and you will develop hypoglycemia. Well done, doctor. You give the insulin with the glucose. 
And then diuretics, except potassium spitting diuretics. Can I use loop diuretics, furosemide? Yeah. Can I use thiazide diuretics? Also, yeah. Next, beta agonists. Why? Because they stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase. And if you recall, the sodium potassium ATPase pump will pump sodium out of the cell, but pump potassium into the cell, leaving less potassium in the bloodstream, treating the hyperkalemia. Next, Let's bind that potassium in the stool to prevent its absorption to decrease the level of potassium in the blood. When everything hits the fan, you hit me with dialysis, man. If you want to learn more about kidney physiology, the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubule, the collecting ducts, the titratable acidity, and much more, download my renal physiology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com to learn about anion gap metabolic acidosis, high versus normal, the serum anion gap versus the urine anion gap, if you want to learn about the serum a smaller gap and the stool a smaller gap, base excess, base deficit, compensated versus uncompensated, etc., download my acid base imbalance course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. If you do not want to download my courses and would rather watch them right here on YouTube, click the join button and subscribe to the highest tier. Hit the subscribe button, click the bell, support my channel here or here, go to my website to download my courses notes and cases. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense.